All right, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say I'm I'm kind of amped up this morning. I've uh, I've had I've had months to prepare, um, days to, to do the final preparations, and I've had about eight cups of coffee this morning, so I'm pretty wired. So hold on to your seats. Um, if you've got any co a coffee, drink it now because you're going to need to keep up. There is a lot going on today, and um, and you know we've got a lot of. Uh, a lot of like housekeeping things and things like that. We're going to kind of blow over that. But I hope everybody found the packet of information uh, in your seats. Thanks to Sheila Figueroa, my administrative assistant, your good friend. Um, she's the one who puts all that together. Um, but there are several things in there. You'll find a sort of a, a, a syllabus, a class outline for the for the sessions that we'll be having. You'll find a, a sheet that says the major themes of numbers. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. You'll also see a couple of other uh, sheets uh, just that are the questions, you know, some ideas for this week and for next week. Uh, but all of those things should be in your packet today. But we're just going to go ahead and dive in to the book of Numbers. And I want to begin this morning by, by talking about the importance of marketing. The importance of marketing. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that marketing, branding, can make all the difference. And the reason I say that is because the book of numbers is the graveyard of New Year's resolutions. What I mean by that is people will say at the, on January 1st, on New Year's Eve, they will say, my New Year's resolution is to read the Bible all the way through. Read the whole Bible in a year. And they read Genesis, and man, they're going strong. They get into Exodus, it's like, woo, this is good. I remember that movie with Charlton Heston. That was awesome. And then they, they, get, into, they get into Leviticus, and they're like, okay, this is about bearing my cross. I'm going to read through this. It's hard. It's like reading like the operations manual of a microwave. But I'm going <laughs> to... But I'm going to read through it. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to endure, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to make it all the way through Leviticus. And then they they they're finally through Leviticus. They think they see the light at the end of the tunnel. And then there's the first chapter of Numbers, and they even look at the title Numbers. And if you are like me and you are a math averse kid, it's like this isn't fair. I went into theology because nobody graded me for bad math. I mean, three equals one, right? I mean, that's, you know, it's, it, we have a whole type of theological math. But, but so, oh, yeah, oh, me too. Well, I'm not going to tell you how many I got. Um, but we, but I've got, let's just say I've got two F's in my name, Robert Ferguson Fuller, but the, the, anyway. Uh, but, but anyway, so the book of Numbers begins with, you know, some census information and just the name Numbers is it's just sort of off-putting. It's like, well, I thought things were going to get good after this, or I thought, thought things would pick up. Well, let me tell you about something about the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers suffers from bad branding. It suffers from bad marketing. Because is, you know, any English printed Bible you find is going to say that the fourth book of the Bible is the book of Numbers. This is true, Barbara Ann, you asked this question yesterday. This is true even if you go over to Temple Beth El and you look at their, their, their pew Tanakh, which is their pew Bible. Um, you know, they, the, the Tanakh is the, is the assembly of the Torah, the, the prophets, the Ketuvim, and the Nabim, excuse me, the Nabim and the Ketuvim, which is the prophets and the writings. So it's all our Old Testament in a different order, same books. But even in, in, the, in the fourth book of the Torah, is you see right there the book of Numbers. But as I was looking at my copy of that, I have one of those, I have a Tanakh downstairs. I was looking at the Tanakh and it said Numbers, because I was wondering, Barbara Ann, she, she asked yesterday, is it even called the book of Numbers in the Hebrew Bible? And it is. But then I looked and the Hebrew was written above it. And, it, and the Hebrew above it doesn't say the same thing as the English title. The book, the, the title Numbers, Arithmoi, is actually the name given to this book by the people who translated it, the Jews who were living in Egypt, who spoke Greek, who were translating it into Greek back in the, I don't know, probably 2nd century B.C. Um, it's a book called the Septuagint, and, and in that book it's called Arithmoi, which is a Greek word for numbers. What they missed was the importance of marketing, of branding. Because numbers sounds boring or at least intimidating. But the word, the title of the book of Numbers in Hebrew is 
Bamidbar. That's what the Hebrew says right above it. Bamidbar. And the words Bamidbar mean in the wilderness. Now, isn't that more interesting? Unless you're one of those weird accounting types. <laughs> and I have always had friends who've been like, ooh, I love spreadsheets. I love it on page four. There's some I didn't carry it too. I'm like, you nerd. Um, <laughs> This, this is more my style. I'm more of a right brain guy. I'm more of the liberal arts guy. In the wilderness, is it, it, it grabs me. You know, it, 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 it should grab us. Because the book of Numbers, once you get past those first few chapters, and you know, there's, there are statistics and logistics spread out throughout the book. But once you get through that, you, you discover that in Numbers are not only some of the most interesting, but some of the most important stories... In the, in the Old Testament. So important, in fact, that there's one story that seems like an obscure throwaway story in Numbers that becomes the foundation for the most famous, the, the most famous verse in the New Testament. It is the background story for John 3.16. And we're going, to be, we're going to take a whole day to look at that one when we get there. But the book of Numbers is critical to our understanding of the New Testament, not just the Old Testament, but to the New Testament as well. It is full of the gospel before the gospel. And so we're going to take a, a deep dive into a lot of these important stories in the book of Numbers. But um, I want to talk about the wilderness a little bit. When we're talking about the wilderness, we're, we're talking about um, a, a very important, not just symbol, but set of symbols. The wilderness can be it can be a literal wilderness, or it can be symbolic. Um, you know, for example, I was talking to Kirk Feldman this morning. Um, you all may know Kirk, uh, Kirk and Susie Feldman. They have a son, Max, who uh, just graduated from high school at the end of last year. Um, and for the summer, he went out, literally, to the wilderness of Alaska to do, I think, either Outward Bound or Knowles, the out National Outdoor Leadership School, was one of those two. But, you know, one of those programs, basically, where they just, where they say, we'll take your money, and then we're going to take you, <laughs> give us $6,000, and we'll give you nothing to survive on. Uh, and, and they said, you know, but, but for, for basically a month, he was out and just living in the backcountry of Alaska. I mean, I'm talking about deep in the back country of Alaska. He was in the wilderness. But then he came home and he went then to South Bend, Indiana, where he is now in a new type of wilderness as a freshman at Notre Dame University. A college freshman is in a new type of wilderness. What is the wilderness? The wilderness is that place that you go that is beyond your comfort. That is beyond your, your, your familiar territory. The wilderness is when you leave your element to get out into the elements. And so you, you know, when you get out into the wilderness, you are beyond that place where you can control the climate. The climate controls you. You're in that place where you're beyond your, you know, your, your creature comforts. You know, you're no longer comfortable around the creatures in the, in the wilderness. You're, you're really out there. Now there's a difference between being outside in nature and being in the wild. I mean, it's the difference between real camping and glamping. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, what it, you know, camping, real camping, is when you're going out and you're surviving off the grid and primitive spots. But uh, Glamping is when you pull up your trailer, you hang out your Christmas lights, you plug in your electricity, and you, then you watch the game on Saturday on the TV that you brought with you instead of watching it back home in your living room. You know, it's, there's a difference between camping and glamping. The book of Numbers is not just about camping. It is about survival. It is about being in an environment that not only, that not only is different, but challenges you, tests you, pushes you to your absolute limits every day. And in the case of the Hebrews, for 40 years. This is a book about that adventure in the wilderness. And it was not just an adventure in the sense of like Disney World is an adventure. You know, it's an adventure like paddling on the Colorado River is, a new, is an adventure. You know, it's, I remember once when I took a youth group up to West Virginia to, to, to do a rafting trip on the New River 
in West Virginia. And up in, up in that part of West Virginia, the New River is lots of class five rapids. Lots of, I mean, it is real, real bona fide white water. And I remember, you know, as we're getting our little orientation talk from the, from the river guide, she was saying, I mean, our you know, kids were messing around. They're teenagers. They're poking each other and they're flirting a little bit and they're, you know, eating stuff and looking at their phones. And uh -huh. our guide, you know, she, in the, in the, for most of the year, she was a school teacher. So she understands kids. She didn't lose her cool or anything like that. She says, she says, now guys, I need to get your attention. She said, she says, we need to remember one thing most of all today. She pointed out to the river. She said, that is a real river. Those are real rapids and they will really kill you. <laughs> she said, this is not Disney World. There are no controls. There are no safety harnesses. There are no, I mean, yes, we are going to give you life jackets and stuff like that, but that is a real river, river. If you don't take it seriously, and she said this, you will be seriously killed. I remember this was West Virginia. You'll be seriously killed. Um, and, and, you know, and that kind of sobered the kids up. You know, this is not, you know, this is not camping. You know, the wilderness is not camping like, oh, isn't this fun? We're setting up a tent in the backyard. This is really in the wild. You know, and, it's, and it really metaphorically can apply to any situation where we are pushed beyond our limits and we are put to the test. The point of the National Outdoor Leadership School, the point of Outward Bound, the point of, you know, so many camping programs is to actually push you beyond what you thought you could do. And I believe that for 40 years in the wilderness, God pushed the Hebrews into, an, into a new level of commitment and challenge. Not because they wanted to, it's not like they voluntarily signed up, but because they had failed. And we're gonna, we're gonna get into all of that. But I want you to think about the wilderness of your own life right now. You know, again, a wilderness is not just a place. A wilderness can be a circumstance. It can be a situation. You know, we nationally have been going through this wilderness of, of COVID. Over the, you know, uh, 20 years ago, we went through the wilderness of 9-11. We're still going through that as we, sadly, over the last week or two weeks have been reminded. Um, it might be a wilderness of a, with a disease or a sickness, a wilderness in a relationship, an addiction. All, you know, there are lots of wilderness situations in our lives. So how do we learn to deal with that wilderness? What is your wilderness? What is that place of testing? What is that place where you're being stretched, where you are not, no longer in your element, but out in the elements? That's what we're going to be talking about. That's kind of what we're going to be applying as we go through this study. So let's talk about the Hebrew wilderness and the wilderness of the Bible. The Hebrew wilderness was an actual wilderness. <laughs> when we talk about the wilderness in the Bible, we're not talking about the forest. We're not talking about the swamp. We're talking about the desert. We're talking about this kind of land, this kind of terrain. You know, I have been married to Morgan for 28 years, and in that 28 years, 30 years we've been together, when you consider count dating, I've been going out to Odessa, Texas, and over those 30 years, I have learned a lot about the desert. Uh, and to quote my good friend Steve Cobb, one of the things you learn quickly about the desert when you're out in it is that everything in the desert was designed to hurt you. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing there that is designed to make your stay pleasant. I mean, whether it's critters or plants, whatever it is, everything out there is designed to hurt you. In the Hebrew mind, the wilderness is that environment that is hostile. It is that place that is, that is designed to push you to your limits and that must be overcome. Now, biblically speaking, we're going to be talking about the 40 years in the wilderness, but let me make a couple of other important references. The wilderness was also the place where we meet John the Baptist. John the Baptist was given the commission, or rather Mark identifies his commission from Isaiah as the place to go and speak the word of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. In the wilderness. What was the wilderness of, into which John was supposed to speak the truth of God. It was the brokenness of Israel, the lostness of Israel. 
It was all of the, the situational, circumstantial mess in which Israel found itself, a conquered country, a confused country losing its identity, not sure, but hopeful that a Messiah was coming. And it was into that wilderness that, that John was sent to be Israel's last Old Testament prophet, that last one to come and to speak the truth of God. It was there that, that John called the people not to, not to pleasure, not to comfort, not to hope, not to prosperity, but to repentance. You know, it's, again, the wilderness is not a place where we go to, you know, to find a new way to be comfortable or inspired. It's a place where we go to be challenged. And, some, and, and in this case, he was t challenging them with repentance. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And he was saying, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. But we also see in the wilderness that, that the wilderness was, in the New Testament, that the wilderness was another critical environment for Jesus because it was in the wilderness that Jesus was forged and tested. It was in the wilderness that the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world was inspected for his purity as a sacrifice. We hear the, words, or we hear the word temptation, perazzo in Greek, and we, we always talk about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. But the word perazzo also means a test. So Jesus was not just being tempted by Satan, as though Satan was the only one who had something to gain in this. Jesus was also being tested, not just by Satan, but by God. And not that God had any doubts about how the test would turn out, but he was being tested to prove that indeed he was the lamb without blemish who could take away, who was worthy to take away the sins of the world. Remember in the Old Testament, you couldn't just offer any old goat up for, uh, up for sacrifice. It had to be the firstborn, pure lamb without blemish. And that's who Jesus is. And he proved that under the harsh magnifying glass of inspection in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Remember, especially, I believe it's the way that, that um, if you really look at the detail of the way Matthew tells the story, Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days before Satan showed up. Well past the, the threshold of human endurance, regular human endurance. I mean, by that point, your body is in full ketosis, eating itself. I mean, it is, I mean, you are, I mean, he, you know, no water, no food at his absolute weakest point. And yet it is there that God proved and tested him. I mean, I, I, I think about, you know, the, the great endurance tests that Jesus had. The temptation in the wilderness and the crucifixion. These incredible, uh, unbelievable, uh, inhuman tests of of survival. And we see that, you know, the, again, the wilderness is the environment in which this takes place. One of the things you'll hear me say a lot of times through this course of this is that the wilderness is the anvil in which the people of God are hammered into shape. You know, the sort of the circumstances of, of, the, of the Bible, the events we'll read about in the book of Numbers, those are the hammer. But the anvil is the wilderness. It is the, the Midbar, the Negev, this, this place of, of absolute hostility. That's the wilderness that we're going to be talking about. So as we go through the wilderness experience with the Hebrews, um, you're going to see that there's some major themes that we want to cover. And um, I found a really helpful tool in my, in my study Bible, which is, you all may know by now, I use the ESV study Bible, English Standard Version study Bible. And if you own that, then you've already got this. But if you don't own that, I just saved you 90 bucks. Um, but this is, this is a chart, a table that shows up in the, uh, in the introduction to the book of Numbers. And again, don't look up Bamid Bar in your English Bible. You'll get lost. You won't find it. Just go by the numbers. But if you look it up, you'll see that they have a table here with four themes, kind of covering the main four themes of the book of Numbers. Um, and we're going to cover all of these themes in this class. But you'll see that there's, there's the, the census. I call this uh, the statistics and logistics theme of, of Numbers, you know, when, when they're actually counting and the purposes and why people do everything like that. There's the theme of rebellion. 
you know, part the, one of the reasons that that the Hebrews were in the wilderness was because of their own rebellion against God. The third is the wandering. One of the things we you know that we're going to dispel immediately is that the 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 idea that the Hebrews wandered in the wilderness because they didn't know the ma- most direct route from Egypt or from Sinai, or that they, they just got lost, or all those bad jokes you've heard over the years. They were in the wilderness wandering because they were prevented from going into the promised land for a generation. God wanted an entire generation of the Hebrews to die out before he would actually fulfill his covenant promise. So again, this is, this is not Disney World. This is, a real, this is the real wilderness. So, so wandering. And then Canaan itself. What does it mean that they entered Canaan into this land? You know, that's going to be a, that's a little bit of a tricky theme. This, I, I will say that the study of the book of Numbers is not Sunday school 100. This is not, this is not kids Sunday school. I, you know, if you go and look, and, um, if you go look in, in like any little child's picture book Bible, you're not going to find a lot of stories from Numbers. You're also not going to find a lot of stuff from Song of Solomon and several other places either, you know, other than Samson, not much from Judges and not really even the interesting parts. Um, Numbers is one of those, it's, it's one of those next level books where, where we, have to, we have to confront the reality that our God is not just the, you know, he is not just the, the sacrificial lamb, he is also the Lion of Judah. And that Christ is the Lion of Judah, that, that our God is a consuming fire. And, you know, and, and while that is scary, we also realize that he's the only God worth having. And so as we go into the whole business of Canaan, we're going we're gonna to hear God commanding the deaths of entire nations of people. You know, it, it, it's almost taboo to call it a genocide, but in, in a sense, that's what you know, God, was, that God was calling for entire nations of people to be wiped out. And our modern, you know, our, our modern sensibilities are repelled by that. Then we start to do a little bit of investigation of who these people were and start to understand that, that they were such a great offense to God that even the merciful God, who, I mean, remember, this is the God who allowed the Romans and the, and the Egyptians, all these other people to live. If, the, if these guys were beyond that, there was something really wrong in Canaan at that point. So we'll even be talking about some of that, but we're... Before, we, before Joshua takes the people into the land, there was, you know, there was a lot of fighting to get there as well. So we're, gonna be, we're not going to fly over those themes. We're going we're gonna to take those themes head on, knowing that they are very uncomfortable. So those are the major themes that we're going to be hitting as we go through, uh, as we go through numbers. But, um, uh, but uh, we'll be coming to them all in turn. You'll see on your outline, you're, there's going to be a lot of skipping around because I'm trying to catch some of these things and themes, especially that first week. I've got you all over the book of Numbers, especially that first 11 chapters, uh, mainly because um, I'm trying to kind of collect all the number stuff into one place. Um, and, you know, it's not all going to be the- thematically consistent at every point. Remember what I've always said. These outlines I hand you, that, that's a... That's a that's a wish list. That's not a contract. <laughs> um, we'll get through the book of Numbers by November, but it may not exactly stick to this. Um, but, but, there, yeah, but we're going to try and hit all those themes in turn. Okay. The good thing, though, about the wilderness, the good thing about National Outdoor Leader School, Ship School, you know, these, these type of expeditions, is that you never go into one of these expeditions, if, you, if you're wise, you never go into one of these expeditions without a guide. And the good thing is, I am not your guide through the book of Numbers. The guy, of course, the one leading the Hebrew people through the wilderness was the Lord our God himself. But his guide, his, his second in command, his, uh, his tour guide, if you will, his expedition guide, his expedition leader was, of course, this guy. Moses, oh, excuse me, not John the Baptist, uh, was this guy, Moses. Um, that is not the exact statue I have in my office, but I do have a little copy of this. But Moses is our guide through the wilderness. He is, second to God, the central figure of the book of, uh, of Numbers. And we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning really talking about Moses because you can't understand 
Moses, or you can't understand numbers without understanding something about Moses, where he came from, and why he is important. Uh, I think that it is so important to, to, you know, to, to just acknowledge the fact that name recognition is important. Um, Moses is a name that most people, even if they are not people of faith, know. Um, he, has, he has an international, interfaith uh, type of name recognition. What, I mean, Muslims know who he is. Of course, Jews know who he is. Christians know, know who he is. But, you know, people who have read literature, you know, he, he is pretty widely known. Um, you know, thanks to Charlton Heston and, and <laughs> Cecil B. DeMille, people know who Moses is. I, I wanted to show you something. You know, you know that you have arrived when they're making an action figure of you. Um, <laughs> preachers get a lot of weird gifts. And, <laughs> and uh, somebody at one point decided, brought me an action figure of Moses. I thought I would share with you this morning. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's, it has on the back. It, it's actually not that bad. It's, it, it explains his staff and the Ten Commandments on the back of the package and stuff like that. Of course, he's, he's got I don't know if he has the Kung Fu grip or not because I've never opened it. But, uh, but I think that's pretty cool. I, I, it was Charlton Heston's first big, big epic. But, uh, but, hit, but uh, you know, name recognition, of course, is, is critical. But we need, to, you know, we need to get to know beyond the name. Who was Moses? I, the, our sidebar here for a second. Let me get political for just a second. Um, y'all may remember a couple of weeks ago, um, the, the new prime minister of Israel came to, um, uh, came to Washington, and he and the president did a press conference together. And, you know, the president, you know, as he, as he was introducing him, said, you know, I've known every prime minister of Israel since, since gold of my ear, and blah, 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 kind of tooting his own horn. And I was just hoping beyond hope that the new prime minister would say, actually, Mr. President, you're so old, you know every prime minister since Moses. Um, but <laughs> it was right there. It was, he could have grabbed it. Anyway, <laughs> Moses is going to be our guide through the wilderness. Now, you know, this is going to be repu- uh, repetition for many of you, but who was Moses and what is the context and, and what exactly is our, you know, what exactly is our uh, our purpose and our context for this story. Well, the Moses period of the Bible is that period that covers Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's, that's four books of the Torah. Actually, all five books of the Torah are considered the books of Moses because he is the one who, who put them down, who, who recorded, who, who saved that record for us. And so, of course, you know, Moses wasn't born yet, so he doesn't appear in Genesis. But all that preamble, all of that, that I, I can't believe I just called that preamble. I mean, the, the book of Genesis is foundational. All that foundation is critical in understanding how the, the Hebrew situation in the wilderness. Um, so let's talk about not just Moses, but let's talk about the Exodus for just a second. If you remember, um, the Hebrew people were brought to, they were brought to Egypt by Jacob, you know, who was also named Israel. That's why they're called the children of Israel. Um, they were brought there because his, his second youngest son, Joseph, had become the vizier, the second in command of Egypt under the, uh, under the leadership of the Pharaoh at that point. And, and this, is, this is very interesting because if we really want to understand this, this part of the story, we need to understand some of the political history and the, and the historical dynamism of what was happening in Egypt between the, the arrival of Joseph and his family in Egypt, around 70 people, and the time when they left, of about, you know, numbering somewhere around 600,000 plus. You know, what happened in that 430 years between the two? Why? For example, did they come in with, you know, with a Hebrew being the number two guy in the kingdom and then leave as slaves or as freed slaves? How, how did they get from, from one point to another? Well, historians and, and biblical theologians, as they, as they take the time period of the Exodus and, and take that time period of the Bible and, and lay it next to the history of Egypt, have, you know, have come to the conclusion that, that Joseph arrived in Egypt in a time when a nation, a tribe, a people called the Hyksos 
were actually in power. The Hyksos were a Semitic, meaning a Middle Eastern people as opposed to an African people, who had taken over, who had invaded Egypt, and who had upset, I believe, the 16th dynasty of, of Egypt, and who, who conquered it, and who were now in control. Now, as soon as they got to Egypt and they conquered Egypt, they took on all the trappings of the Egyptians. So they, you know, they, they looked Egyptian, they tried to speak Egyptian, but we also find a lot of Semitic, Hyksos words coming into the, the Egyptian language at that point. We also see um, Canaanite gods being brought into the, the uh, Egyptian pantheon at that point. But the point is, you know, when, when they took over, all of a sudden you had this Semitic, meaning Middle Eastern, Arabic, people of the Levant, you know, people of Palestine, all that area. You had those people now in Egypt in control. So when Joseph and his family arrived, they were just kind of another group of Semites, another group of these people from, you know, from Mesopotamia, from Syria, all that group coming in. There were probably lots of other people coming in at that time because of that famine, but Jacob and his family, Israel and his family, they were coming in and they, you know, they rose to prominence because of Joseph's, uh, because of Joseph's position in Egypt. Well, over the course of the next four centuries, they grew, they prospered, they multiplied, but then what happened? Then the real Egyptians, after, you know, after figuring they had been subjugated long enough and been ruled by these foreigners long enough, decided to take back their country. And so they, so there was a, a revolution of sorts, and a new Egy Egyptian dynasty overthrew the Hyksos, uh, the Hyksos foreign dynasty, and became the new royal line of, of Egypt. Well, when that happened, suddenly all these people who had been on top, like Joseph and his family, suddenly they're on, you know, they're, they're no longer special guests of the Egyptians anymore. They went from being honored guests to unpaid interns, I mean slaves. Um, they, went, they went from the top to the bottom. And of course, as this new dynasty rose in power, they also wanted to rise in glory. And uh, by the way, there, there's so much interesting history of what was going on culturally in Egypt and, and with the with the Hebrews, the word Hebrew actually is a, is a more generic word that's become interchangeable with Israel, but it's not exactly the same word. Hebrew actually refers to a freed slave, interestingly enough. It's a, it's a Semitic word referring to that. Uh, it's actually Ibiru is a, the, original, the original word. Um, but uh, but any, in any case, as, they, as the Egyptians rose to power, they also wanted to rise in glory and international claim, so they began these enormous building programs. Um, you know, whether, you know, new cities, new, new monuments, new tombs, all of those sorts of things. And of course, now all these people that were in there, uh, that they considered interlopers, well, they'll make good slaves. And so, what they did, after they, after they conquered the, uh, after they conquered the, um, uh, the Hyksos and rose to power, they immediately began these building programs and subjugating the peoples, building these new temples, new monuments, and everything else. And, and that's why we find the Hebrew, it's really kind of an interesting sort of throwaway line. A new Pharaoh rose to power in Egypt who did not know, uh, the, the, who did not know Jacob and his family, did not know Israel. And so, yeah, that's, that, that's about 400 years of history summed up in one line which you're wishing, I wish you'd done that, Bob. Um, but, the, but you have a tremendous power shift here. And that's, you know, and that's where, he, where, of course, not only the story of Moses begins, but the story of, of Israel as a distinct people uh, begins again. Um, we remember that the story of Moses begins with a decree from Pharaoh that the, Hebrew, the Hebrews are becoming too numerous. There are too many of them. What does that mean? This is a dictator. This is a king. This is an emperor saying, there are too many foreigners living in my country. They are becoming too big, powerful, prosperous. They are going to overrun us. And we've got to do something about that. Don't want to kill them all. They're a good labor force. But let's knock out a generation. Or at least let's just knock out this week's generation. And so 
he sent, you know, he sent his soldiers out to go and, and, and to, murder the, um, to, to murder the children of Israel. And, and so, you know, as we, you know, as we see, you know, as we uh, see the, the children of Israel laboring, you know, for these tremendous buildings, we also have this horrible story of genocide. Well, we know the story that, that the mother of Moses decided that, um, that her son had to live. And so she had her daughter go and hide him in the bulrushes near where the, near where the, the princess of Egypt would be bathing. And, you know, it's, the, the Bible almost tells a story like everything that happened was just sort of quinky dink kind of coincidence, right? That, oh, the, she put him in the water and, oh, happened to float down to the princess of Egypt. And, oh, here's a little girl who happens to know a wet nurse who, oh, happens to be able to take care of it. What you, and, like, so you've got, you've got all the people, you know, it's like, here's a baby, you know, and from the princess of Egypt. You know, here's, it's like, oh, look, a baby. Oh, how convenient, a little girl who knows a wet nurse. Wonder if these things are connected. You know, and then even the pharaohs, like, okay, my daughter's brought in a new baby. I don't know from where, but okay. So there was a, sort of this conspiracy of, of non-acknowledgement going on. All these women, the midwives, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the sister, you know, Moses' mother, the princess, her maids. You know, it's like in the providence of God, God is using all these wonderful women to, pre- to preserve his people. And that's, a, you know, and, and that's something I don't want to be lost here. But, you know, of course, we know that, that while, you know, while Moses was, was growing up, in Pharaoh's palace, in the heart of Egyptian, uh, in the heart of Egyptian aristocracy, he was also being taught by his mother, who was his wet nurse, who was telling him about his people, telling him about his family, telling him about his true identity as one of the children of, of God, one of the children of Abraham. And so as, as Moses continued to grow, that identity began to grow in him. And of course, we know the story that he that he saw a, he, uh, an Egyptian taskmaster who was m- mercilessly beating a slave, a Hebrew slave, and he murdered him, buried him in the sand, and thought, okay, I've done something for my people. Well, then he broke up a fight between two, uh, two Israelites, and they said, well, who do you think you are? We know that you're a murderer. And once word got out about that, obviously they were not the only ones who knew. Other people knew about this. He fled to the land of Midian, or we should say rather the wilderness of Midian, where, where Moses lived for about, let me think, 40 years. You know, it's, you know when, when, when we come back to Charlton Heston at the burning bush, you know, 40 years have passed. And what's, what's happened in that time? Moses has gotten married. He's gotten a family. He's got, he's, he's got a whole new career. He's a shepherd now, you know. Um, and so he's, he's got all that stuff. He, he has moved on. He is, I didn't even think about this. He, as a shepherd, he was on the lamb in Midian. Uh, where's, where's Neil when you need him? Um, but he was, he was hiding out in Midian. And I think that probably, you know, he thought that the civilized world was finished with him. He thought that his Hebrew family was finished with him thought his Egyptian family was finished with him. I mean, the Pharaoh's reach was long. If he wanted to, he could have gotten to Moses had he wanted to. Um, it turns out that God was not finished with him. I mean, the same God who worked out his survival on the Nile River was the same God who came to him and spoke to him in one of the most incredible theophanies recorded in the Bible. That is a God appearance in the Bible. He appeared to him as a as a bush or as a flame in a bush that was not consuming. And he had one of the most important conversations, or really declarations, that human ears have ever heard. He told Moses that he had heard the cries of his people and that he was going to send Moses to tell Pharaoh, his, his, adopted, his adopted grandfather, to let his people go, or his, you know, his family, to let his people go. And Moses said, and exa- who do I say <laughs> is sending me? Who exactly is sending me? And this is when God revealed to Moses something that he had not revealed before, which was his own most 
personal name. He said, Eye Esher Eye. I am who I am. I mean, this is a, this is a name that's not just saying, you know, I, this is who I am. It's, it captures the aseity of God. Are you familiar with that word aseity? Aseity means the being of God. It's one of the most important concepts of Christian theology, that God is who he is in his being. There is no other thing that is, I-S, like him. He is who he is. By implication, everything else is not him. He is who he is. I am who I am. Before Abraham was, I am. It's fascinating. You have, it's like English teachers, you know, would just write red all over that for, you know, for subject, verb, agreement, and tense, and all that. But I am who I am. Before Mo Moses was, I am. And he identified himself to Moses and says, my name is all the authority that you are going to need. And with that, he sent Moses back to Egypt to talk to Pharaoh. Now, Moses, as we all know, resisted this call with every excuse in the book. Starting with, I don't talk so good. <laughs> and I, meaning, I, and, and I don't think it was that Moses was a stutterer or anything. I don't think he had a speech impediment. I think it was just he was scared out of his mind when he met a holy God. I mean, again, you know, we, we hear all the time, or I, I remember hearing people all the time say, oh, when I see God in heaven, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him a big old hug, or I'm going to, yeah, I've got a couple questions I'm going to ask him. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind about this. No, you're not. Remember we talked about in Revelation? When we face a holy God, when somebody faces a holy God, at least in the times it's been recorded in the Bible, what happens? They collapse. They melt. Isaiah curses himself. Oi vey, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. Woe is me, I am undone. John falls on his face as though dead in Revelation. Moses, I mean, you know, take your shoes off, dude. You're on holy ground. It's like, oh, I mean, can you... Have you ever like tried to get your keys out and unlock your door when you're like in a hurry or something? Can you imagine Moses trying to get his shoes off at that point, just freaking out? He's undone. He's I wouldn't I couldn't speak at that point. You couldn't speak at that point. I mean, in some ways, I think that the reason he had to get Aaron to speak for him was because Aaron still had some some sort of grounding in. <laughs> I mean, he was sort of protected from that. And so Aaron became, the, Aaron became the mouthpiece. And so they went to, together to see Pharaoh. And I, th I find it fascinating that, that Pharaoh, you know, for the first thing they ask Pharaoh for is they, they don't ask for total freedom for the Hebrew people. What do they ask for? Just let us go out and worship our God. Let's go, let us go out into the desert and worship our God. And what did Pharaoh say? No. no. And what was his answer? His answer was essentially, in essence, his answer was this. I don't know who your God is, but these people are not his people. These people are my people. They belong to me. He's not their God. I am their God. You know, what is it that God says? God says, it says I alone will you worship and serve. Pharaoh is saying, no, 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 no. I am the rising and the setting sun. You will worship me. You will serve me. I am your bread. I am your salt. I am your water. I am your world. I am your God. And Pharaoh, by his own obstinance, sets up a conflict that is not just you know, seen as, you know, a freedom walk, but is seen as a divine battle. We have to remember that Pharaoh was not just a king. He wasn't like a constitutional monarch like Queen Elizabeth. It was not even like a, you know, like a, you know, like a, a king who, suffered, who, uh, who served under the divine right of kings, like Louis XIV, who said, I am the state. Remember, Pharaoh thought that he was a god. Specifically, he thought that he was the god Horus. Because ever since he was a little kid, he was told, you are the manifestation of the god Horus. 
who was one of their, you know, one of their war gods. He thought that he was, you know, his job was to be, you know, was to be the god on earth of Egypt. And so he was a, he was, he was himself an idol. And he, and, and the worst thing is the idol believed it himself. And so the conflict between God, between Yahweh, I am who I am, and, and the son of Horus was a cosmic battle. And when I say cosmic, I'm using that in the Greek sense. It was a world, a universal battle in which the God who is showed the world who is not God, the God who is not. And it's fascinating that this cosmic battle is a battle that is fought with all the weapons that divinity has under its control. I mean, God didn't pull a sword. God didn't raise up an army. What did God do? God sent nine weapons of mass destruction that we call plagues. And these, these are not the, I mean, these are not the kinds of, of, these are not the kinds of weapons that are forged in a forge or built in a lab. These are the kind of things that God says, I'm going to, I'm going to change the river that you depend on to blood. I'm going to block out my son. I'm going to send my frogs, my locusts. And if you're still going to be stubborn about it, I'm going to take away the life of every firstborn child, every firstborn male child, just like you tried to do to my people. God said, you know, one, one of the things that we have to remember in, in that final tenth plague is that there is, I mean, it's not said but there is definitely the unveiled message there of, you think I forgot about that? You think I forgot about that? God has a long memory. And he's not going to let his people suffer under somebody like that. And so, after the plagues, after Pharaoh finally allows God to leave, after his own son dies in that final plague, the people of Israel are finally allowed to leave. And the people of Egypt are so terrified of God's power at this point. I mean, I think they were ready to fold way before the Pharaoh was. It was you know, and I think the Pharaoh was ready to fold before Pharaoh did, but God, to make his point, kept hardening his heart, if you remember. Paul even refers to that in the book of Romans. That, you know, that it's like when you rebel against God, God doesn't just let you up off the mat. I mean, when you, if you're going to fight God, God as, as pseudo-God to real God, he's not going to let you up off the mat. And so they were terrified. And so when they left, they took as much, I mean, the people of Egypt were like, good riddance, take anything you want. Take our gold, take our, take our, our fine treasure, take it all, just get out. Well, after they got out, a few days later, they realized, wait a minute, we may have given them too much. And that's when we come to the Red Sea incident, when once again, once again, the God of the universe showed his power, not only over the universe, but over any would-be gods of earth. And not only did God, not only did Yahweh provide a way through the, the, uh, through the Red Sea, by his own power, but he also used that same power to cut off Pharaoh's pursuit and to destroy his army. It's interesting, you know, if, again, if you, read, if you read the history of this region in this time, Egypt did not, Egypt's sort of return to power sort of ended abruptly. <laughs> Why? You think plagues had anything to do with that? You think the one-day destruction of your entire army had anything to do with that? I mean, Pharaoh, I mean, Pharaoh Egypt was on the rise, and history tells us that just kind of stopped. <laughs> Did they get bored? No, they got they got hammered. But it's interesting that Moses, leading the people through the Red Sea, um, does you know brings them into what will be this wilderness period in a way that's very interesting and in that they also exit it in the same way. It's like, you know, the, the Christian theology sees this as, as the baptism of Israel. You know, that here they are passing through the water, they're going in, 
And when they come out into the promised land through the River Jordan, they're coming out. I mean, it's like Red Sea and Jordan River. <laughs> And so, so, you know, in a sense, Israel has been, has been baptized in this, in this event, as well as the army of Pharaoh being destroyed. Well, of course we know, and, and we're wrapping this up here, it, it, of course we know that while they were in the wilderness, Moses became the one who was the lawgiver for, uh, for the people of Israel. And we, and we need to understand something, too. When, you know, we as Christians, unfortunately, because of a lot of bad theology that's been peddled ever since the first century, have pitted the law and grace against each other as though they were two separate things. The law is actually an instrument of grace, of God's covenant grace. The law is the x-ray. Y'all heard me say this in the sermon about two weeks ago. The law is an x-ray or a lab report that tells you you're sick. <laughs> Um, and if you don't have that lab report or that x-ray, you're not going to know you're sick until all of a sudden you're dead. So it is a blessing, even though it's, it's the bearer of bad news sometimes. But the law, more importantly, in the Hebrew tradition, in the Israelite tradition, in the Jewish tradition, is not seen as a curse. It's seen as a function of God's caring. Who is the more loving parent? The one who tells their kids... I want to keep you safe. I want to keep you healthy. So you stay out of this area. You do this and you, you know, just keep it in the rails. Or the one who says, I don't care, do whatever you want. Which is the more loving parent? The Hebrews, the, I mean, the, the Jews, the, you know, the people of Jesus saw the law of God not as a burden, but as a gift. It was not a... It was not a penalty. Rather, it was a sign of relationship. Because what is the first commandment? Don't start with the second phrase of the first commandment. The second phrase of the first commandment is what? You shall have no other gods before me. What is the first phrase of the first commandment? I am the Lord your God. And if you read the preamble to that, it's, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt did all these things. I mean, before the law is given, Moses recites the history of what's happened. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. But, you know, this, please understand the, the, the grammar of what's being said here. He does not say, I am the Lord a God. The words in the Ten Commandments are Yahweh Elohenu, which means not, I am Yahweh a God. It means, I am Yahweh your God. This is a relationship. This is, this is not a God who, who just wanders around and says, well, I've got people over here, I've got people over here, I've got people over here. You know, he's saying, I am the Lord, your God. I am in this with you and you are in this with me. Now, let's talk about what we need to do to keep you safe and healthy. But we are here because I am the Lord, your God. And so the, so the law is not, is not a, a penalty. It's a gift. And so that's, you know, so it is Moses who stewards that gift, who, who helps them to live into that reality for the next, you know, really for the next 60 or so years. Because you've got the, I mean, you've got, well, not 60, you've got several years before they before the actual 40 years in the wilderness begins. But, you know, during that time, Moses is teaching them God's law. Moses is teaching them about this relationship. He's teaching them about God's gifts. And he's saying, this is what it means to be God's people. So, as we move forward into, uh, as, as we moved, uh, move in forward into Numbers, we're, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about this guide, this God, you know, Moses being the guide, the God who leads them. And we're talking about this people who are going into the wilderness, into this environment to be challenged, to be tested, to be pushed. You know, some would say, well, to be punished. I like the word chastened better. I mean, there were times when, yes, if you ask me, you know, are my parents punishing me for something I did? Yes. But why were they doing it? Why were they chastening me? They were, ch they were chasing, uh, chastening me 
to make me a better man, to make me a better person. And you know, there's there's no cruelty in what God does. There's no and there's you know, and this is something we'll talk about. There's no injustice in what God does, even in the most harsh things that we see in the Old Testament. But there is but there is chastening. You know, to say that, to imply that it's unjust means that they didn't deserve it or that we didn't deserve it. Um, but there is, you know, but, but there are some hard things, but there are also glorious things. One of the things we're going to read in, in, um, uh, in the book of Numbers is that in spite of the Hebrews complaining, whining, murmuring, rebellion, paganism, idolatry, everything, I mean, you think, you think you know kid, people with problem kids? You think you've got problem kids? How about 600,000 of them? <laughs> and yet God is the loving Father who says, through it all, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So, pack your bags, lace up your boots. We're going for a little bit of a hike. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for giving us this time today, and thank you for, thank you for walking through the wildernesses of our lives with us. Thank you for not abandoning, abandoning us, and thank you for not sending us out into the wilderness by ourselves, but thank you, Lord, for not sparing us the wilderness moments of our lives, because those are the moments that we learn and we grow. Help us to learn from the Hebrews' wilderness experience and help us to come closer to you in that journey. We pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen.